We were at um, Attention with Dolores, <clears throat> chapter 13, which I'm not going to say much about, other than what happened in Harry's detention on pages 266 and 67. <clears throat> So he's got to write lines. I don't know if, you know, teachers still do that in grade school. I remember many times, because I was a very uh, outspoken child in grade school, mm -hmm. many times having to write lines, you know, I must be quiet in class or, you know, I shall not talk or something like that. But, you know, I was slightly above average in, in brains. And this was back when we had blackboards. And because of on the odd chance that somebody would come in and teach music or something like that. You know, every teacher would have in their classroom one of those things that kind of looked like this. This way. It would look like this and would have a holder here and here and here. The musical thing has what, four lines? Yeah. And you could stick chalk in that. And so I would use that. I would stick four pieces of chalk in, you know, I must not talk in class, so I'd write four lines once. Of course, I usually had to do like 100 lines, so I'd have to do it 25 times. Well, Harry's got to do that, but he's got to write, I must not tell lies. And when he writes it on the page, it comes on his hand. You know, and at first it kind of hurts, but he has to do it until his hand is bleeding and he has cut into his hand. I must not tell lies. It's so deeply cut that in book seven, he's going to hold his hand up like this to another character to show the scar. I must not tell lies written on his hand, right? So, he shows Ron and Hermione, and Hermione's like, you got to tell Dumbledore. Harry's like, nope, not going to tell Dumbledore, okay? Go to McGonagall, say something. 272, Ron says. Nope. I want, don't want her to let her know she's got to me. Harry, I don't know how much power McGonagall's got over her. Dumbledore, then tell Dumbledore. No, he's got enough on his mind. Okay, all right. Um, he goes back for his next one. Because how many, how many nights of detention does he have? Full week. Okay. So he goes back every night. Chapter 14, Percy and Padfoot. Harry writes Percy, uh, writes Padfoot, right, Sirius, sorry, I get the name right. Writes Sirius, tells him about Umbridge. You know. And page 287, we get the press clipping about Sturgis Podmore. Trespassing at the ministry, being arrested, sent off to Azkaban and such. Well, I'll take that back. Yeah, six months in Azkaban. Um, 296 and following. Ron gets a letter from Percy. What's Percy say in this letter? Please stop hanging around Harry Potter. Stop hanging around Harry Potter. Okay, what else? What's he say about Dumbledore? Days are numbered. What's he say about Umbridge? What does he call Umbridge? How does he refer to her? Delightful. Delightful. Okay. Her name, Dolores. Anybody know what the word means? Have you ever heard of the Via... Dolorosa in Jerusalem, it's the way of sorrows. That's Dolores right there. <laughs> it's where she gets her name from. Sorrowful. Umbridge, if you take umbrage at something, means you get angry about it. Right? So her her name is not a positive, you know, rainbows and unicorns kind of a name. It, it implies pain and suffering and anger and hatred and stuff. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
So, showing what does that tell us about Percy? Two ninety eight bottom. I do hope, Ron, you will not allow family ties to blind you to the misguided nature of our parents' beliefs and actions. I sincerely hope that in time they will realize how mistaken they were, and I shall, of course, be ready to accept a full apology when that day comes. Oh, how big of me! You know, what a pompous. <laughs> Percy, he's, he's Percy, okay? So, serious, uh, da, 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 let's see here now. Sirius's head shows up in the fireplace, 301, 302, and Harry talks to him about Umbridge. And Harry says, middle, 302. So you don't think it had anything to do with Umbridge touching me when I was in detention with her? You know, she touched him and he felt that pain and stuff? Serious, I doubt her. I know her by reputation. She's no death eater. She's foul enough to be one, Harry says. And then Sirius makes this statement. Yeah, but the world isn't split into good people and death eaters. Notice, it's not you're good or you're a death eater. It's what? There's a continuum. Really good over here. Really, really bad over here. And most people, you know, are in that, and they, you know, slide back and forth, right? Because where's Percy now? He's over on this side. By the end of the book, he's, well, take it back, not the end of this book, by the end of the series, he's going to be back over, okay? So, series has to leave because, you know, they see the hand in the fire coming for him. And we get chapter 15, the Hogwarts... High Inquisitor. Now, the other day, I don't remember if I did in this class, I mentioned, you know, what's Percy's middle name? My other class, I did. Ignatius. And I think she does that because in book seven, we're going to hear of an Ignotus, one of the three brothers. Ignatius is related to that. But it's also, I think, because St. Ignatius of Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuits. And what were the Jesuits famous for? Anybody know? The Spanish Inquisition, which was to root out heresy. Okay? And here we have a high inquisitor. Ministry seeks educational reform. Dolores Umbridge appointed first ever high inquisitor. So, you know, we read the thing in the Daily Prophet about the High Inquisitor, and, you know, Percy is quoted prominently and such. But we do find out on page 308, Wisenkamot elders, Griselda Marchbanks, Tiberius Ogden have resigned in protest. Hogwarts is a school, not an outpost of Cornelius Fudge's office, says Madame Marchbanks. This is a further disgusting attempt to discredit Albus Dumbledore. She's going to show up later on. Okay. Um, let's see here. You can skip a bunch. I think I've said before in class, you know, this book needed a really good editor because it's 200 pages too long. Um, could easily be cut. So here he gets in trouble again, page 319. Detention from Umbridge. And so he gets sent to McGonagall because she's his head of house. She has to approve it. Potter, 319, very top. You must get a grip on yourself. You are heading for serious trouble. And what does she do? She takes five, five points from Gryffindor. Why do you have to take points? Because detentions do not appear to have any effect on you. What's she trying to do to get Harry to change his behavior? Is McGonagall trying to get Harry to change his behavior to acquiesce entirely to Umbridge? No. What does she want him to do? Keep his head down. 
right? So, uh, let's get the branch again. Bottom of 325, top of 326. They're talking about defense against the dark arts. How well is that class going? I hear snickers. <laughs> it's not, okay? You can even say it's worse than, than um, Lockhart. So, Hermione says 325. We can't do much by ourselves. Ron says, we can't do much by ourselves. I mean, and I'm writing, no, I agree. We've gone past the stage where we can just learn things out of books. We need a teacher, a proper one. One who can show us how to use the spells and correct us if we're going wrong. Harry, if you're talking about Lupin, no, I'm not talking about Lupin. He's busy. Who then? You, Harry. Top of 326. Moment silence. About me what? I'm talking about you teaching us defense against the dark arts. Harry stares at her, then he stares at Ron. That's an idea, Ron says. What's an idea? You, teaching us to do it. But, notice, Harry's grinning now. No, sure, the pair of them were pulling his leg. But I'm not a teacher. I can't, Harry, you're the best in your year at defense against the dark arts, Hermione says. Me? You beat me in every test. Oh, and look at we a little detail we never found out before. Actually, I haven't. You beat me in our third year, the only year we both sat the test. And had a teacher who actually knew the subject. I'm not talking about test results, Harry. Why? Because what are tests? Theoretical. Not practical. It's the difference between war games and natural war, you know. Look what you've done. What do you mean? Or how do you mean? Ron, you know, I'm not so sure I want someone this stupid teaching me. Let's think. Uh, first year, you saved the stone from you know who. Harry, that was luck. That wasn't skill. Second year, you killed the basilisk, destroyed Riddle. Yeah, but a fox hadn't turned up. Third year, you fought off about 100 dementors. You know that was a fluke at the time last year. You fought off you-know-who. Listen, says Harry, now almost angry. Just listen, all right? Sounds great when you say it like that. But all that stuff was luck. I didn't know what I was doing half the time. I didn't plan any of it. Turn back for a moment to page 167. Harry's up in the room, alone, thinking. Bottom of 166. Well, Ron and Hermione were with me most of the time. That is, when he'd done these other things. Not all the time, though, Harry argued with himself. They didn't fight Quirrell with me. They didn't take on Riddle and the Basilisk. They didn't get rid of all the Dementors. They weren't there in the graveyard. Notice all four things that Ron has just referred to. Harry's already had this thought. Right? And now, Ron brings it up to him, holds the mirror up to him, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And when he had that thought earlier, why is he having that thought? What are Ron and Hermione this year? Prefects. Here's like, what the heck? I, Ron? Okay, Hermione, you can. Ron? Really? Ron and Hermione are smirking, and Harry's not. I know it went well, all right. I didn't get through any of that because I was brilliant. I got through it all because, because help came at the right time, or because I guessed right. Bottom of 327. You don't know what it's like. Neither of you had to face it. You think it's just memorizing a bunch of spells and throwing it. Ron, we're not saying that. 328. Hermione, Harry, don't you see? This is why we need you. We need to know what it's really like facing it. And she says the name for the first time. Right? 
Voldemort. Think about it. Okay. So, Hogshead. Harry agrees. Um, let's see here. They go into the Hogshead. And how many people did Ron and Hermione say would be there? A couple. Bottom of 337. So who did you say is supposed to be meeting us? Just a couple of people. Told them to be here about now. I'm sure they all know where it is. Oh, look, this might be them now. The door of the pub had opened. First came Neville. The Dean and Lavender who are closely followed by Pravati and Padma Patil, and Cho, and one of her usually giggling girlfriends. So right there, page 337, that's seven people. More than a couple, right? Top of 338, Luna Lovegood, then Katie Bell, then Alicia, then Angelina Johnson. In other words, the Quidditch team, okay? Colin and Dennis Creevy. Ernie McMillan, Justin Flinch Fletchley. Harry has earned Ernie's and Justin's what? I don't want to say friendship, admiration, back in first book. And second book, sorry. Hannah Abbott, there's a name that's going to come up later, the last name. And the Hufflepuff girl with a long plate down her back whose hair, name Harry didn't know. Three Ravenclaw boys, Anthony Goldstein, Michael Corner. Terry Boot, Ginny, followed by a tall, skinny, blonde boy with an upturned nose on the Hufflepuff Quidditch team, bringing up the rear, Fred and George, and Lee Jordan. 25! Plus Ron and Hermione at 27. Plus Harry, 28. 28 high schoolers, essentially, show up at a bar. Because that's what the hog's head is. Hogshead is not like the three broomsticks, okay? And what kind of bar? This is a dive bar. This is a, a you know, a, a biker bar, essentially, okay? So why are some of them there, apparently? Like Zachariah Smith. What happened? What happened? Tell us. Right? Tell us what happened. Dumbledore believes it, Hermione says, 340. You mean Dumbledore believes him? Right. And who are you? Zechariah Smith. I think we've got a right to know. Makes him say, you know, who's come back. Hermione says, well, and here he goes, oh, it's okay. What makes you so? What makes you want to know? I saw him. Dumbledore told us you saw it. Said Diggory could kill him. Yeah. Harry, if you want to know what it looks like when Voldemort murders someone, can't help you. <laughs> Can, but he won't. Okay. So, one of the girls asked, bottom of 341, is it true you can produce a Patronus? Yeah. A corporeal Patronus? That is, a Patronus with a real body? Uh, you don't know Madame Bones, do you? She's my auntie. I'm Susan Bones. She told me about you here. So you can make a stick. Yeah. Blimey, Harry, says Lee, who's Fred and George's year, two years older than... Okay, Harry's in his fifth year. Lee's in his seventh year. I didn't do that. Wrong. Boom. Uh, Fred says, Mom told Ron, Mom told Ron to not spread it around. She said you'd get enough attention as it was. She's not wrong. How significant was that, by the way? You know, notice Susan Bones said, my auntie told me about it. Why? Because back at the trial, what did Amelia Bones, her auntie, say? And you've been doing this since your third year? 
Here, yeah. Why is that so impressive? Well, when Lupin teaches it to him, what does he tell him? There are many fully qualified, that is, adult witches and wizards who can't do it. Okay? So they go on. And did you kill a basilisk with that sword and double it? Yeah. Wow. And Neville's, Neville wants to get in on the action. Oh, yeah. And he, he dumped the thing with the sorceress stone. In the British version, it says phosphorus to confuse with philosophers. Right? And Cho then throws out, and he had to get to roll the test last year. So, everybody's you know, all puffing up Harry's ego and such. So, there, Harry agrees he's going to do this. And Hermione's going to come up with the little you know, coin to kind of tell him when the next meeting's going to be. So, we get a new educational degree. And if you've never been there, if you ever have an opportunity to take a study abroad course, go to London and go to the Warner Brothers studio outside London. Not Universal in Orlando. Go to the real one where they did the shooting, okay, and where they have all the props. You know, I, I told my Monday, Wednesday, Friday course, you know, and you look at, for example, the tapestry in the Black House that has the toujours pure and all the names and stuff, the genealogical tapestry. It's about the size of this wall. And it's, it's actually all woven. It, none of it's fake. And the names are actually burned out. It's like somebody took a little blowtorch and just went, pshh. Okay. All the educational decrees are framed. And, and in this little hallway, you kind of wind your way around and just before you go into where the castle is. Okay. You really, I hate the films. I actually de absolutely detest them. The studio tour blew my sock, blows my socks off every time I've gone. I've seen it, I think, I don't know, four times. So, new. Educational decree. All student groups are banned. Notice, what is a group? Any group or any meeting of three or more students. What does that mean? Literally. Anytime Harry, Ron, and Hermione are together, that's a group. Okay? By the way, what other kinds, real world, not Harry Potter. Who does this kind of thing? Totalitarian societies. North Korea, China, Soviet Union, Cuba. They don't like groups of three or four or five or more because what inevitably happens? You start backbiting about the government, you start plotting. That's why, okay? So, um, keep going on. I'm trying to skip a lot. Uh, Harry gets a thing from Sirius, says same time, same place, and it's what show up in the. Uh, Fireplace. And Umbridge is now going around doing what to teachers? Observing them. Observing them. You know, when we have faculty who go up for tenure or promotion, usually when you go up for tenure, not for, for promotion, other faculty members will often come into the classroom, sit in the back, and observe. They'll write an evaluation of what happened in that classroom. Usually it's 90% BS and 10% you know, accurate. It's all the person had total command and control of the classroom. All the students were bright and wonderful and good looking and asked you know, superior, profound questions, you know, even if they were all as silent as the desk. You know. So she goes around, so she starts asking questions. And in this chapter, 17, on 363, she's in Snape's class. 
And so she asked, so how long have you been teaching at Harvard? 14 years. You applied first for the Defense Against the Dark Arts, I believe? Yes. But you were unsuccessful. Obviously. Like, wham! You know, just smack her down right there. And you have applied regularly. Okay, now when is she doing this? In the classroom. While students are in the classroom. It'd be like if my department chair came in and started asking me these kinds of questions in front of all of you, you know. And you've applied regularly for the Defense Against the Dark Arts post since you first joined the school, I believe. Yes. Do you have any idea why Dumbledore has consistently refused to appoint you? I would suggest you ask him. Oh, I shall. I suppose this is relevant. Oh, yes, the ministry wants a thorough understanding of the teacher's order of backgrounds. Does this tell us anything about his background? No. What do we already know about his background? In the Weasleys, Ron, Hermione, Snape was a Jack Weasley. Hmm. Okay. So, we go on. Um, don't skip on that. Go on to Dumbledore's army. Chapter, uh, sorry, page. Nope, uh, 386. Harry asked Dobby, I need a place for a group of people to meet. I need to find a place where 28 people can practice. And Dobby tells him about the room, the room of requirement. What is the room of requirement? It's kind of like a disappearing room until you need it. And when you need it, it becomes what? What you need. So Harry needs a room where they can practice stuns and spells and such. And Dobby shows them where it is. They go in, and there's bookcases. And in the bookcases are all kinds of books about spells, defensive spells, offensive spells. And then there's cushions all over the place so, be, so that when you stun somebody and they fall, they're not going to get hurt when they fall, right? Cool, that worked out well. There's dark detectors, all that kind of stuff. So, before they can actually practice, they've got to come up with a name. What are we going to call ourselves? And we get 391. Angelina. The Anti-Umbridge League. Or Anti-Umbridge League. Or Fred. The Ministry of Magic or Morons Group. Hermione. Hmm, more of a name that didn't tell everybody what we're up to. You know, Anti-Umbridge. Kind of obvious. Cho. How about the Defense Association? You know, Brits love the word association. The Football Association, the FA Cup and so on, right? Jenny, yeah, DA's good. Notice who suggests this, by the way. Cho is Harry's heartthrob right now. Jenny's the one he marries, right, eventually. The DA, for short, says Cho, Jenny, DA's good. Only, let's make a stand for Dumbledore's army. Like we take our marching orders from the man. Why? Because that's what the ministry's afraid of. And everybody says, yes. Right. So Harry says, well, let's start with a charm. Let's use the disarming charm. 392. Oh, please. Zachariah Smith. I don't think that spelling army is exactly going to help us against you know who. Harry. Saved my life last year, and we could jump to the end of book seven. Okay. So, notice everybody partners up. Who's left alone? Neville. And there we have that, you know, that whole thing of all the best, pe best people get chosen, 
And Hufflepuff says, I'll teach the lot. What does Harry do? Come here, Neville. Partner with me. What is that, you know, the best, Harry? And nobody. <laughs> Neville, right? And what do we see Neville do? Okay, admittedly, look at the context. Harry's got his back turned to him. He's not ready. Middle 393. Neville does the charm. I did it. I've never done it before. I did it. Good one. Not pointing out that in a real duel situation, Neville's opponent was unlikely to be staring in the opposite direction. Why does Rowling do this? Neville's not the bumbling fool everybody assumes he is. That is, he does have some ability. What's he need? Motivation. Look at the word that Harry that uses is used to describe encouraging him. Who does Neville live with? Describe Grandma Neville. Cold, vindictive. I won't say the next word. She's not nice. In fact, we're going to see in a few chapters, you know, she says something to Neville about, you shouldn't be ashamed of your parents. And he's like, Mom, Grandma, I'm not ashamed. I mean, she's a piece of work. It's why when he sees the boggart, it turns into two people. Snape in his grandmother's clothing. You know, it's got to do that to make it, you know, disappear. So, um, Luna, you know, comes out and supports Harry. We get the chapter Lion and the Serpent. And the Weasley is our king and such. Uh, Hagrid shows up. And where's Hagrid been? We're not going to talk about it other than why he's been gone. What did Dumbledore say to Fudge? His second recommendation. That's at the end of the last book. First one was get the Dementors away from Azkaban. Second one, send an envoy to the giant. He can't remove the Dementors from Azkaban. He can send an envoy to the Giants. So he sent Madame Maxime and Hagrid, right? Unfortunately, the Giants said no. We're going to find out why later. Next chapter, Eye of the Snake. Uh, we see Umbridge question Hagrid. Turns everything he says upside down, turns them inside out. We see the DA meeting again, and Cho comes in for the kill after everybody else leaves. You know, Harry's under the mistletoe. And, and let's see here. 458, 459, no big deep significance, it's just funny. <laughs> this is one of the things Rowling does well. You know. Ron asks, how was it? Because Harry and Cho kissed. What? Because she was crying. Ron, are you really that bad a kisser? I, I don't know. Hermione says, of course not. So Harry kind of explains what happened. And then Hermione explains how Cho's feeling, middle 459. Well, she's feeling very sad, obviously, because of Cedric dying. Then I expect she's feeling confused because she likes Cedric and now she likes you. Harry, or now she likes Harry. And she can't work out who she likes best. Okay, pause. What's the problem with that logic? Male speaker here. She can't work out who she likes best. What's dead? Male logic says, hello, one's dead. <laughs> Unless you're into necrophilia or some weird stuff, you know, leave the dead one alone and find a living one, you know. <clears throat> Question? Okay, you're not the question. So, um, and she's feeling guilty because thinking it's an insult to Cedric's memory to be kissing Harry at all. And she'll be worried about whether whatever else might say if she starts going out with Harry. She probably can't work out what her feelings toward Harry are anyways because he was the one who was with Cedric when Cedric died. What? 
Anyways, so that's all kind of very mixed up. Wrong. One person can't feel all that at once. They'd explode. Just because you've got the emotional range in people doesn't mean we all have them, right? I don't know. I'm kind of with Ron on this one. Maybe I've got the emotional range of a tablespoon. Um, notice, by the way, what does rolling do with all of that? Chuff. She's a mere distraction. She gets pushed aside. When things start to get naughty. She just kind of gets rid of her, right? So we find out Hermione and Victor Crumb have been corresponding back and forth. And Harry has a vision. Pages 462. Uh, yeah, 462 and following. He wakes up screaming. They take McGonagall, and he tells McGonagall what he saw. She takes him to Dumbledore. Let's see here. 468. Dumbledore asks him, how did you see this? Uh, inside my head? No, no, no. What's Dumbledore mean? What perspective? From what perspective did you see it? Were you standing beside the victim? Or were you looking down on it from above, like, you know, looking into a pit? Yeah. Harry, um, I was the snake. So it wasn't, I saw Mr. Weasley get bit. It was, I bit Mr. Weasley. Okay. Is Arthur serious? Oh, yeah, blood all over. So, Dumbledore starts issuing commands to the you know, pictures and such. And Dumbledore sends Harry, Ron, Hermione away. They get Fred and George and Ginny also. Um, and just before they touch the port key, 474. It happened in a fraction, bottom of the page, it happened in a fraction of a second in the infinitesimal pause between before Dumbledore said three. Harry looked up at him. They were very close. So I kind of think, you know, Harry's here, Dumbledore's here, so Dumbledore's like right here. His clear blue gaze moved from the port key to Harry's face, and boom! His scars dropped. Now, Harry knows from the previous book there are probably two reasons why his scar hurts. What are they? One, when Voldemort is near. Or two, when he is feeling a particularly strong stream of rage. Hmm. And, boom. So they're taken back to The house, let's see here. So, they're at the headquarters, 479. They want to go see Arthur and Sirius cries out for where Creature is and doesn't show up. He tells. Harry tells Sirius how he saw what happened, okay, and they make their way eventually to St. Mungo's. Uh, Arthur's been trying, you know, muggle healing and such. 491. Second time we get exposed to... Um, Fred and George's wonderful invention, extendable ears. The first time was when Harry was taken to the headquarters of Order of the Phoenix at the beginning of the book. So, Harry and the others are outside the room. Molly, um, Mad Eye, and others are in the room with Arthur. And Weasley, Mrs. Weasley says, You know, Dumbledore seems, this is page 491. 
seems almost to have been waiting for Harry to see something like this. Moody, yeah, well, you know, there's something funny about the part here. Of course he's worried that a, that a dumb boy. Boys seen things from inside, you know who's snake. But if you know who's possessing them, and, you know, Harry now thinks he's being possessed. So, goes back to, they go back to the house, the headquarters, and Harry goes and shacks up by himself in the room. Yeah, and he talks with Phineas Nigelus. Who's Phineas Nigelus? And he's only called Phineas Nigelus, by the way. He's Phineas Nigelus Black. Sirius's great, 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 great grandfather, you know, former headmaster at Hogwarts. Well, he's thinking, I gotta get out of here. I'm the weapon Voldemort's looking for. And pretty Snide Jealous kind of tells him, you know, maybe you should just do a Dumbledore sentence. Maybe you should just stay put. So who finally draws him out? Ginny, Fred, and George, Harry, Ron, Hermione. Ginny says $4.99. We wanted to talk to you. But as he's been hiding ever since we got back, he said, I don't want to talk to you. Jenny says, um, I'm going to be says, we heard what you heard. So you think you're being possessed. Have you tried talking to someone who was possessed before? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Lucky you, Jenny says, top of page 500. Why? Because she hasn't forgotten her experiences in book two. So you think I'm being possessed? Well, here, let's see. Big blank period where you don't know what you've been up to? No. Then you know who hasn't been possessed of you. But the dream. Hermione, Harry, you've had these dreams before. You've had flashes of what Voldemort was up to. Notice what Harry's not doing. He's not putting two and two together. Right? In fact, it's going to take Dumbledore to kind of explain it. Well, not literally double door, but kind of. So they have Christmas on the closed board. Let's see here. Um, Hermione tries to be nice to creature. And they go up to St. Mungo's. They see Gilroy Lockhart. And let's go to 512, 513. I'm just curious why you think. Why do you think she brings up Gilroy Lockhart? Because she doesn't do anything else with it. He doesn't get referred to any anymore. Is this kind of what his self-love results in? His being locked inside forever? I don't know. Anyways, you're up there on that wing, and you hear the name Longbottom, page four, 512. Harry's head spins around. <clears throat> Curtains have been drawn back from the two beds at the end of the ward, and he sees Neville. And Harry suddenly realizes where they are, why Neville's there. Before Harry could stop Ron and the others, Ron yells out, Neville. Okay. Mrs. Longbottom. Friends of yours, Neville, dear, top of 513. Neville looked as though he'd rather be anywhere in the world than here. Then he just kind of nods. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I know who you are, of course. Neville speaks most highly of you, now that Neville says Harry. And you two are clearly Weasleys. Why, red hair? Yes, I know your parents. Not well, of course. And you must be Hermione Granger. Yes, yes, Neville's spoken about all of you. You've helped him out of a few sticky spots, haven't you? He's a good boy. He hasn't got his father's talent. I'm afraid to say. Well, your dad's back there? Because when she says he hasn't got his father's talent, she kind of nods towards the back. What's this? You haven't told your friends about your parents, Neville? No. He shakes his head. 
It's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud of them. Oh, proud. They didn't give their health and their sanity to their only son, so their only son would be ashamed of them. Think about that. Should he be proud that his parents are insane? No. No, not really. This is the, the false attribution of glory to what they endured. No, I'm not ashamed. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it. And so she explains to them what happened to Neville's parents. They were oars, you know, and very well respected within the wizarding community. And in comes... In comes Alice with something like this. Okay. Neville's mother had come edging down the ward in her nightdress. She no longer had the plump, happy-looking face Harry had seen in Moody's old photograph of the original Order of the Phoenix. Her face was thin and worn out. Her eyes seemed overlarge, and her hair, which had turned white, was wispy and dead-looking. She did not seem to want to speak, or perhaps she was not able to. But she made timid motions toward Neville, holding something in her outstretched hand. Again, Mrs. Longbottom says, Very well, Alice dear, very well. Neville, take it. Whatever it is. But Neville had already put out his hand, into which his mother dropped an empty, dribble blowing gum. Very nice, dear, said Neville's grandmother, in a falsely cheery voice, patting his mother on the shoulder. But Neville said quietly, thanks, Mom, and Mom turned around and shuffled back to bed. It used to be really hard for me to teach, me to teach because my mom died about five years ago. And this description, spitting image. I'm a full nine-year-old. Why is that significant? Look at what else, what else we're told. Very nice to have met you all. Neville, put that wrapper in the bin. She must have given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. And what does Neville do? He puts it in his pocket. Okay. What did Dumbledore tell Harry, previous book, about Neville in the holidays. He visits his parents. Mrs. Longbottom, his father's mother, says what? She must have given you enough of those to paper, that is to wallpaper your bedroom. That tells us how many times Neville has visited. The implication is every time he goes, his mother gives him a Drupal's blowing bubble gum. What day is this? It's Christmas on the closed world. What has Mrs. What has Neville's mother, Alice, just done? She gave him the Bible. And Neville, not seeing it as junk, receives it as a present. He takes the intention for what it is. What else does it show? Possibly at least. There's still a bit of Alice there. She's, there's still a connection. Notice his father doesn't speak. It's like that's gone. There's still a bit there. Hermione. Nor me. Harry, I did. Dumbledore told me, but I promised I wouldn't mention it. That's what Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for, using the Cruciatus curse on Neville's parents. Notice, he brings up Bellatrix, and what does Hermione's well developed mind do? What is a, what is a, a, a good instance? of a well-developed mind. That is, a mind that is well-trained to think. It makes connections. She thinks Bellatrix, 
It's Christmas. What did she give? What did she leave before they made this trip? She gave the creature a Christmas present. What does creature have in his little den? A nice little framed portrait of Bellatrix Lestrange. Wait, Bellatrix Lestrange is it? That woman creature's got a photo of in his den? Hmm. Yup. So, 10.30. Occlumency. Snape shows up. He tells Harry, Headmaster wants me to teach you occlumency. What is occlumency? Yeah, anti-mind reading studies, you know. <coughs> um, <coughs> if, if, if it's possible to read minds, then it should be possible to block that out, okay? So Snape's going to teach him that. And they're like, Harry's like, why you? Because that's you. Yeah, you just whined him. <laughs> because the headmaster wants me to, okay? So... Harry has his first occlumency lesson. 5.30. Yeah. Um, let's say 5.34. Top of the page. Notice the snake. Tell him how to try to stop it. Yeah, kind of. Harry gets to its feet, feeling nervous. They face each other. You may use your wand to attempt to disarm me or defend yourself any other way you can think of. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to break into your mind. Okay. I've been told you have an aptitude of resisting the Imperius curse. I mean, it's similar. Snape had struck before Harry could do anything. And he was five, watching Dudley, riding a new red bicycle. His heart was bursting with jealousy. It's page 534. He was nine, and Ripper the Bulldog was chasing him up a tree. Dursleys were laughing. He's under the sorting hat. It was telling him to do well in Slytherin. Hermione's lying in the hospital wing, covered in black fur. He's there on the side of the lake. The mentors are coming. There's Cho coming at him under the mistletoe. He's like, oh, no, not going to watch that one. Harry, did you see all that? Well, back up. 534, did you mean to produce a stinging hex? Snape asks, no, thought not. You let me get in too far. You lost control. Did you see everything I saw? Flashes. To whom did the dog belong? My Aunt Marge. Well, for a first attempt, not as poor as it might have been, you managed to stop me eventually, though you wasted time and energy shouting. You must remain focused. Repel me with your brain. You will not need to resort to your wand. Why does Snape see these images? Except for the last one. All the other images are what? He's five. Dudley gets a new red bicycle. Well, here he is. He's nine. The dog's chasing him up the tree. He's under the sorting hat. Sorting hat says, he sees Hermione. These are all troubling. Okay. What has Snake just got an experience of? Okay, what else? Harry's not the chosen one, per se. Harry's had a troubled background. What's this meant to do? It prepares us, a little bit at least, for what Harry's going to see when he sees Snape's memories. Okay? Which Harry's going to do in one of the occlumency lessons, and then even more, when he looks in the pensive. So, clear your mind, Potter, 535. Let go of all emotion. Yeah, right. How easy is that? Where else in the books has that happened to Harry? 
two times. Now, one of them's a series, the other one is another separate event. And he's put her in an imperial space. And the whole sense of self is wiped away. Okay? So, Snape does it again. You're not helping me. Let go. On the count of three, one. His father and mother are waving at him out of an enchanted mirror. A great black dragon. Cedric Diggory lying on the ground, dead. Okay. Get up. You're not trying. Top of 536. I am making an effort. I told you to empty yourself of emotion. I'm finding that hard at the moment. Exact middle of 536. Then you will find yourself easy prey for the dark lord. Fools who wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions, who wallow in sad memories and allow themselves to be pro provoked this easily. Weak people, in other words, they stand no chance against his powers. I think it's interesting that he uses fools and then he describes what kind of people which he labels as weak. People who love. Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. We hear Puck say, what fools these mortals be after they have this kind of love fight, which Puck just loves. You know? I'm not weak, says Harry. Then prove it. Master yourself. And yourself is one word there. I think it would have been better if she had separated it. Master yourself. Control the you. Okay? Control your anger. Discipline your mind. Okay? Happens again. This time, Harry gets to the corridor with the doors. And he asks Snape, what's in the Department of Mysteries? What? I said, what's in the Department of Mysteries? Sir. I don't think Snape meant sir. I think Snape meant, why do you want to know what's in the Department of Mysteries? Harry thinks Snape is trying to teach manners. And why would you ask? Because, you know, I've been having this dream, and it leads to the Department of Mysteries, and Voldemort wants something. Okay. So, they end their lesson, and here he goes and tells Ron and Hermione him. He tells them what he's seen. Uh, 341. He has another vision of, you know, maniacal laughter and such. The Beetle at Bay. Um, big breakout from Azkaban and Broderick Bode is discovered dead in his bed. We have a new educational decree. 551. Teachers are hereby banned from giving students any information that is not strictly related to the subjects they're paid to teach. Right? Which kind of creates all kinds of problems. Let's see here. Um, so, Harry and Cho go off for a date, but he tells Cho, I've got to meet Hermione. You don't mind if she comes, you know, part. And she's like, what? And Hermione shows up, and five, sixty-four, sixty-five. With Rita Skeeter and such. And what is Hermione's deal? Why is it the beetle at bay? What's the at bay part mean? It's a, it's a hunting term. Fox hunting, what do you do? You let out the foxes, excuse me, you let out the hounds, and the hounds get the fox at bay. It's why you have baying hounds. Right? It's they, they get the animal treed or they get it, you know, um, contained into a corner. 
Well, Rita Skeeter is what? She's trapped, right? Because Hermione knows what about her. She's an animagus. And if you don't do what I want you to do, then I'm going to tell everybody you're an animagus. What's Hermione doing? Threatening? What's the more legal term? That's blackmail. Extortion. Right? She's breaking the law. Right? What does she want Rita Skeeter to do? Well, you don't want me to tell little Mr. Goody Two Shoes story. She goes, No, that's exactly what I want you to do. Only difference is, what story will she have to write? The true one. <laughs> the true one. No embellishment. You're going to write it exactly as Harry says. And it's going to be published in the Quibbler. Right? Which means what? It's the Quibbler. It's like the National Enquirer. But even the National Enquirer, every now and then, has a real story, has a real scoop. It was the National Enquirer that broke John Edwards' adulterous affair in 2004 when he was running for president. That's why he had to back out. Right? 2004? Yeah. No, 2004. 2000, I think it was. Whatever year it was. Okay? So she agrees. Seen and unforeseen. Uh, we get Harry's article comes out. Okay? And we get a new order of the High Inquisitor. Any student found in possession of the magazine Quibbler will be expelled, which does what? Back in 1987, Martin Scorsese released a film, okay, this was 87, called, I think it's the right one, The Last Temptation of Christ, okay, based on a novel by a Greek novelist, Nikos Kazantzakis, okay, and Christians, a lot of Christians, didn't like the film because it had a scene in it where Christ is hanging on the cross and he's having a hallucination. And in the hallucination, he and Mary Magdalene, I think, are having sex. No, it isn't, you know, scandalous and all this kind of stuff. So what did they do? They started boycotting and picketing and blah, 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 blah. In other words, free publicity. Okay. The film did not get have very good critical response until that negative publicity. And then the critics are all. Oh, this shows bravery, you know, blah, blah, blah. The, the film, you know, it, it's not very good. It's, but the Christian community created this audience for it, almost, all right? What does Umbridge accidentally do? She makes it so that almost everybody wants to read this issue of the Going to, you know, imagine if MTSU had a mandatory meeting that you had to go to, okay, and the president were to come out and say, the governor of Tennessee and the president of the United States does not want me to tell you this, but I think it is for your well-being. Everybody's ears are going, what? Okay. So, everybody starts reading. People come up to Harry. I agree with you. Seamus, you know, Finnegan comes back, comes around. Luna tells him her dad's having to reprint the issue. Okay. <clears throat> Harry has a vision, 584-85, of Rookwood and Voldemort. And that poor Avery again. Rookwood says Bode never could have removed it. We don't know what the it is. But Avery was the one who said he could. So Avery gets Cruciatus. Cru Crucio, not Cruciatus. Um, Harry tells Ron and Hermione, and he says, you know, I was Voldemort. I was the one doing the Crucio, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Harry has an occlumency last night. 590. 
snake seized part of that memory. He says, um, what was that? I don't know. No, no, I mean the one with the man kneeling in the middle of a darkened room. That's not the one. How do you, how did that man in that room come to be inside your head, Potter? I, I, it's just a dream. Okay. So they continue talking. Snake wants to find out if, you know, Harry really knows why he's learning Occlumency and such. He does it again. McGillivancy. 591 at the bottom. The mentor's coming. Harry uses Protego. Snape staggered, his wand flew upward, away from Harry, top of 592. And suddenly, Harry's mind was teeming with memories that were not his. A hook-nosed man was shouting at a cowering woman, while a small, dark-haired boy cried in the closet. A greasy-haired teenager sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling, shooting out flies. A girl was laughing and a scrawny boy tried to mount a bucking broomstick. Enough! Notice, Snape had to use a verbal command. <laughs> what happened? Harry got in. Snape's not as strong as he says he is. Notice, Harry doesn't go. What were those memories? Who was the man? Who was the Dark-haired boy crying in a corner. Why? Because he knows who they are. And what does Harry now experience that Snape experienced before? Keep going. I read an article last night by a conservative writer named Rod Dreher. And it's about... um. Friend of his, another another writer, a, a, a opinion writer for the New York Times, a guy named Ross Zuthat, who contracted Lyme disease. You know, you get it from ticks. One of my godsons had it, got it when he was like 14, 15, was bedridden for he been essentially about seven years. In that seven years, he read white. So when he started NTSU, he knew more than most of the English professors. I mean, he taught himself Greek and French and Latin and all that kind of stuff. Anyways. The article's all about this guy's journey with this illness that doctors couldn't identify because Lyme disease is very hard to diagnose, right? But it's all about going through the darkness, the pain, the suffering, and coming out the other side, right? Harry's been introduced now to what? Snape's darkness. Okay. He's going to get another introduction later, which is going to just blow his mind. All right? So, they do it again, and this time he gets to the end of the corridor, and one of the doors opens. Snape picks him out. There's a commotion. Harry and Snape go upstairs. Trelawney's been sacked by uh, Umbridge. But Dumbledore replaces her. Notice, because Umbridge doesn't have authority to replace her. Dumbledore replaces her with who? Ferenz. Which is? Who is? Which is? Her terminology, Umbridge's terminology, a half-breed. A half-breed. Kind of like a mudblood. <laughs> Animal, human, kingdom, mixed thing. Okay? So, Ferenc starts teaching them about the signs. Chapter 27, Centaur and the Sneak. Talks about Horoscopes, or Parvati does. Notice. Bottom of 502, 602. Professor Trelawney did astrology with us. Mars causes accidents and burns and things like that. And when it makes an angle to Saturn, like now, that means that people need to be extra careful. That, said French calmly, is human nonsense. Okay. What? That's an aspect of real world, so to speak. Magic. 
For instance, bullshit. <coughs> right? True. Sybil Trelawney may have seen. I, I don't know. Right? But she wastes her time in the main on the self flattering human nonsense. Nonsense humans call fortune telling. He says, I'm here to explain the wisdom of the centaurs. We watch this guy for the great tides of evil or change. Right? And he points to the star directly above Harry. Which is? Notice, it's above Harry. Bringer of battle. It shines brightly above us. And notice what we're told. In the past decade, indications have been that wizard time is living through nothing more than a brief poem. In 1989, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, a famous historian wrote a book called The End of History. The whole thesis or premise of which was the Cold War period is over. It's no longer the West against the Soviet Union. Now it will usher in, he suggested, this era of globalization where all the nations will join hand in hand in St. John Lennon's imagining and will turn all our weapons into plowshares and will create you know, nirvana on Earth. Yeah, and what happened? 1993, well, 1991 happened. Desert Shield, 1993. Anybody know what happened in 1993? February, the first World Trade Center bombing, right? 1995, Timothy McVeigh, Oklahoma City, the Murrah Federal Building, domestic terror, not, you know, People going to school board meetings, real domestic terrorism, okay? 1996, the Cobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. 2000, the Co In other words, no, there is no end of history, you know, kind of a thing. So he's pointing this out, all right? Keep in mind, this is published in 2003, right? So, uh, they have another DA meeting. Bob, uh, Dobby comes in and says, you know, you're going to get caught. Harry does get caught. He gets taken up to Dumbledore's office. Twelve minutes. Uh, towards the end of the chapter, page 610. Office is full of people. There's Dumbledore sitting behind his desk, serene, you know, tips of his fingers like this. There's McGonagall standing rigidly beside him because it's McGonagall. She can't stand, you know, at ease and hang loose. She's an uptight Scot. Um, there's Cornelius Fudge rocking backward and forward on his toes beside the fire. There's Kingsley Shacklebolt. Looking wizard Harry doesn't know. That uh, starts with a D. His name's going to come up in just a moment. Dollish. Okay. There's Percy. You know. So. Harry gets asked some questions. So no, no, no idea why I'm here. You haven't broken any decrees? No, no. So they bring in the witness, Marietta. Who's Marietta? Marietta Edgecombe. Right. Uh, excuse me. Marietta's mother is Madame Edgecombe, so her last name is Edgecombe, and. Who is she, though? She's Cho's Wiggly Aunt. Okay. And what has been jinxed onto her face? Sneak. See, Hermione made a thing unbeknownst to anybody. If you, remember, if you reveal us, you're going to have this happen. Okay. So, uh, we're going to skip a bunch. Bottom of 614. Dumbledore takes credit for the founding of the DA. Says there was going to be a meeting at the Hogshead, but, you know, didn't go through. And let's pick up with uh, 
confiscated. See what they've named themselves? Fudge has the piece of paper with the name Dumbledore's Army and everybody on it. He says, shoot, go. Well, the game is up. Would you like a written confession? Or will a statement before these witnesses suffice? Uh, Dumbledore's Army. Not Potter's Army. Dumbledore's Army. But, but, you, that's right, you, yes, you, yes, tonight was going to be our first meeting. I see now that it was a mistake to invite Miss Edgecombe. Marietta nods. Why? What's happened to her? She's been imperialist by Kingsley. Silence. What are they supposed to be learning? Non-verbal communication. Okay. So when Dumbledore says that, she nods. Then you've been put. Yes. Carrie, no. Dumbledore says, Carrie, quiet. Yeah, shut up, partner. So they go back and forth. And Fudge says, all right, you'll come with me. You'll be charged since Azkaban. Bottom of 619. Oh, shoot. Yes, yes, I thought we might hit that little snag. Snag, I see no snag. Well, I'm afraid I do. Really, it's just that you seem to be laboring under the delusion. I'm going to, what is the phrase? Come quietly? I'm not going to come quietly at all, Cornelius. I have absolutely no intention of being sent to Azkaban. I could break out, of course. Who else has broken out? <coughs> Bunch of people this book. Why? Because they united with the Dementors. Dumbledore is saying, you could surround me with 100 Dementors. Not a problem. Bit of hubris, maybe, but you know, it's justifiable. I could break out, of course, but what a waste of time. And frankly, I can think of a whole host of things I'd rather be doing. Notice Umbridge is getting red. Fudge is, you know, about to have a fit. Dollish makes a little move, and Dumbledore says, Don't be silly. I'm sure you're an excellent or I seem to remember you achieved outstanding in all your newts. In other words, sit down. I trained you. Don't even try, okay? But I will, I would hate to have to hurt you. So, you intend to take on Dollar Shackable, Dolores, and myself single handed, do you? Dumbledore, murder fear, no, unless you force me to. McGonagall, here and not to be single handed, you know? Yes, I will, you're not. Right. And what happens? Fudge gives a command, and Dumbledore just, you know, kind of goes. <laughs> A little flick of the wrist and psh. Okay. Five twenty sorry, what's it Kingsley? It was done six twenty one. Unfortunately, I had to hex Kingsley too, or it would have looked very suspicious. He was remarkably quick quick on the uptake, modifying Miss Edgecombe's memory like that while everybody was looking the other way. Because yeah. she didn't remember, she didn't answer. So Gumbledore tells Harry one thing. Oclu. What words do we get that are related to that? It's spelled different. Reverse the U and the L. Occult. Like, what is hidden? Occlumency is to block, you know, what is there. So we get. 28, Snape's worst memory. So now, Umbridge is the new headmaster, mistress, right? <clears throat> and, let's see here. Fred and George have decided they're done with school. And they start setting off fireworks. Umbridge seeks help from other teachers. They're like, sorry, no, but we can't teach, tell students anything outside our subject. You know, so, so. <clears throat> Harry has another vision. Uh, I'm trying to figure where the chapter is. There it is. 
He's having a class with Snape, occupancy lesson. Snape has to leave, uh, 639. And Harry sees the pencil. And knows what the pencil does. He's wondering, why does Snape leave the pencil? What thought is Snape trying to hide? And so he goes in. And what does he see? There's James, there's Sirius, there's Lupin, there's Pettigrew, there's Snape, and they're all taking their owls. In other words, they're Harry's age. Okay. Now here's the problem I have with this pencil, or this Snape's worst memory. It's Snape's memory, right? Where should Harry be in this memory? All the time. Think of the memory as a recording. He should be with Snape. <laughs> See, where was Snape when Jane, when, when the marauders were off at the lake? Snape wasn't there. Snape was somewhere else. He shows up. So how come it, it's like he enters into this alternate reality, he can just move about at will. But if it's based on Snape's perceptions, Snape wouldn't know what was happening over there, right? This is a, a conceptual problem with the writing. She hasn't fleshed this idea out yet, or hadn't thought of all of that, all right? So, Harry goes off with his father and the others to the lake. 6.45. Time for issues. Maybe. Serious. I'm bored. But he only says that what? There's James. He's got the snitch. He lets the snitch go. He lets it go a little bit. And he catches it. And James like, put it away. Right, Sirius is like, put that away. Quit showing off. If it bothers you, he says, James says, Sirius, I'm bored. Wish it was full moon. Wow. What does that mean? Yeah, because Lupin would be a werewolf. And then we could do what? We could transform into our other self, other forms. Lupin, you might. See, when Lupin transforms, is it pleasurable? Is it fun? No, it's painful. He says, we've still got transfiguration. Come on, help test me. Serious, I don't need to look at that rubbish. I know it all. This will liven you up, Padfoot, says James. Look who it is. And they see Snape. Snape is on his feet again, still in the owl paper in his bag. He emerged from the shadows of the bushes, set off across the grass. All right, Snivellus, says James. Snape reacts so fast, you know. What do they do to Snape? They hang him upside down so his robe, and notice he's not wearing pants under it, because they don't. If you're Scottish and you're wearing a kilt, you don't wear anything under it, you know. To reveal his underwear and stuff to Lily when she shows up. Hello, Echo? <laughs> what is this? This is the Death Eaters with the Robertsons. But this is James and Sirius doing it. To Harry's arch enemy. Right? And Lily Evans says, Leave him alone. I will if you go out with me. I wouldn't go out with you if it was a choice between you and the giant squid. Okay? Leave him alone. 648. Evan, don't make me hex you. Take the curse off me. There you go. You're lucky Evans was here, Snipless. I don't need help from a filthy little mudblood like her. Woo! And then, you know. So, 649. Been enjoying yourself, Potter? 
amusing man, your father, don't you? I think you will not repeat what you saw. And what else? Boom, rock, I don't care what Dr. Bush says. I'm done. Okay, we'll stop there and pick up with career advice. We might be able to finish on Thursday, actually. Might. It'll be close. All right. So I'll put up two.